Anyway, grab your Bibles with me tonight. I want to minister on the subject tonight of divine purpose. And uh, the Lord has been dealing with my heart about this. And so, would you grab your Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 3. And then we're also going to go into 2 Timothy chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Verse 8. Um, does anybody have a King James Bible? Yeah. Anybody let me borrow their King James today? Thank you, Bob. Thank you. I want to preach this out of the King James. I had intended to bring my King James because my concordance, everything, as you know, different versions, they change the wording. And uh, so everything I'm going to minister tonight is out of the King James. And uh, I, I grew up on the King James. It's still probably my favorite version. I, I went to the New American Standard about three years ago because I think it's easier to understand for people that are initially uh, hearing the word. But First John chapter 3 and verse 8, I'm going to, I'll catch up to you in just a second. Let me find it. You may know that your own Bible, it's like you know your own Bible better than somebody else's. It's weird. Okay. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So Jesus had a purpose. Let me turn your Bibles over to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 10. I want to read that this, uh, tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, my charity, my patience. When we were at, what sparked this is when Cindy and I were at a uh, uh, conference, uh, the young man that preached, that pastors in uh, Yakima, just a 38 year old, I think 37, 38 years old, but he said something that sparked uh, the, the Spirit of God in me. He said, Satan is not too concerned about fighting your gifting, not really even concerned about fighting you. He's concerned about fighting your purpose. And, and he said, even in your church, every church has, every believer, but every church has a purpose, a specific purpose in the kingdom of God. And that's what Satan will try to fight. And I just want to use this as an example. You know, this music stand, its purpose in its creation was to be a music stand. That's the only purpose it was actually created for. Any other purpose, and it's not being used for what it was created to do. You, you might be able to use it for something else. I don't know what it would be, but... But if you're not using it for it, the only reason, the only purpose this has is to be a music stand. There's actually a purpose for you and I, a single purpose that you and I were born to fulfill in the kingdom of God. Now I want to say, uh, well, let me just pray. Father, we just come before you tonight. We ask for your anointing. We ask for your help tonight as we minister. Holy Spirit, come. We understand our need for you. We're totally dependent upon you tonight. As always, in Jesus' name, amen. Let me just say this. What Satan's at war against is your purpose. And I want to spend a little bit of time backing this up. So turn your Bibles over to Romans chapter 1. I'm going to, I'm going to look at several scriptures, but I want to support what I'm about to, or what I just said. Romans chapter 1 and verse 13. It says, Now, brethren, I would not have you ignorant that oftentimes I purposed to come to you, but was but was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also. But what he's actually saying is there was a warfare against that purpose when he went to go to Rome. Turn to Job 33. I'm probably turning really fast for a lot of you. Especially if you're new in the scripture. <coughs> Just finding one and I'm already turning to another one. Job 33 verse 17. Uh, this is Job in, his middle, in, in the middle of his warfare. He, said, he says this that he may withdraw man from his purpose. And so he's talking about the attack of the enemy, that Satan is trying to withdraw a man from his purpose. 
Let's turn your Bibles, if you would, turn your Bibles over. I know, like I said, I'm, turning, I'm, I'm going fast. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 18. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 18. I should have, I should learn at some point to actually get into the new age, uh, into this age and use a computer, but I'm just too backward. Uh, Every purpose is established by counsel and with good advice make war. That tells us that there's going to be a war against your purpose. You even need to plan on the fact that there's going to be a war against your purpose. And the last one I want to look at is Ezekiel chapter 4. Some of you are just laying your Bibles down and saying, forget it. I, know. I hear you. Ezekiel chapter 4. No, that's not right. Maybe it was Exodus. Anyway, you know what? Forget about that one because I'm not even sure what scripture was. I was writing down. <laughs> but I want to I say that, that uh, whatever your purpose in the kingdom is, that's where your fruit will be. And, and so many Christians, you're kind of just hanging out. A lot of believers just hang out. They kind of just fill spots and, and fill, uh, you know, offices and fill titles and all their life. But if you were to ask them, what really was your kingdom purpose? They would say, you know, I, I really don't know. I've never known. And, I, and it's, it's scary uh, to me how often that is true. You know, something Cindy was reminding me, this young man said, uh, when we were there, and, you know, to be honest, he was, uh, because where, where I was, he was offensive, but it was probably the anointing on his life. He said, most Christians are not committed to the purposes of the kingdom. They're committed to their title. They're committed to their paycheck. They're committed to their position. And he said, that's why that he will not even tell anybody and people will come into a staff meeting and he'll say uh, to he'll say to the children's ministry leader, you're not in charge of children's ministry anymore. You're now going to do this. And he'll look at somebody else and say, you're in charge of children's ministry. And he said, what it keeps people from doing is becoming loyal to their position instead of becoming loyal to the kingdom and to the purposes of God. And I thought to myself, oh, buddy, man, I would have... I, I, I mean, I think most pastors sitting there probably thought, oh my goodness. But it would be, not that I'm, I'm never going to do that. I want you to know you're not going to be sold that Saturday morning. But, you know, there are times that I think we have to ask ourselves, am I even aware of the kingdom purpose for my, my life? Now, let me just say something. I'm going to probably, this is probably going to upset, uh, upset a lot of people, or not a lot of people, but some people, is that we mistake our natural purpose for our kingdom purpose. If you were to ask a lot of people, what is your kingdom purpose? They would say, well, my kingdom purpose is to be a dad or to be a mom or, or whatever. And that's not necessarily true. That's definitely a purpose and it's a valuable one. But that may not be and probably is not the extent of your kingdom purpose. Kingdom purposes take the revelation of God to show you. Yeah. Kingdom purposes probably will never even be known in your life unless you have an encounter with Jesus. Most people think that their natural gifting is their purpose. Most people think that. Uh, you know, Jensen Franklin thought because he could play a sax and he could sing and, and he was anointed, he thought his call was to be a worship leader. And it was way into his ministry life that God said that's not, and revealed it, that that wasn't his purpose. His purpose was to preach and teach. And so many times... You know, brothers and sisters, I, 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 I had to decide in my own heart that when I got up tonight, I would not try to force this in the flesh. Because you're going to have to hear it in your spirit. You know, sometimes, to be quite honest, I think, Lord, uh, uh, am I making any difference at all? Because sometimes we get into this, go to church three times a week or two times a week or one time a week or one time every other week or whatever, and I, and, I, and I beg the Holy Spirit, Lord, you, you've got to take this and you've got to drop it down into somebody's spirit and let it agitate and stir so that some, at some point somebody comes out and says, you know, I'm ready to grab a hold of the purposes of God. See, there's something that a kingdom purpose alone can do in your life. It gives you a sense. Of, it gives you a sense of why you're here. 
It gives you a sense of destiny. See, working a job, and, you, and, and I'm not saying don't quit your job. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying anything other than kingdom purpose doesn't fill that God-sized hole in your spirit. Yeah. It will not. Yeah. It may pay the bills. It may get you by. But it won't be that thing that gets you up every day and, you, and something in you says, I know that I'm right in the center of what God wants to do. And I'm going to tell you something. You will never know divine power until you know divine purpose. Because it's your divine purpose that will demand divine power. And many times we want divine power, but we do not want divine purpose. Because divine purpose is going to test us. Divine purpose is going to tear at things in you that if you're, if you're in the flesh, you will not. You will never go after that because it's going to get to some things in you that is uncomfortable. Brothers and sisters, you don't read of anybody in the book that was not a man or woman that at some point decided I'm going after my divine purpose. See, I'm going to tell you something what happens to most preachers. Truly God called, God intended men and women of God. They say, I'm going to go get a secular job because it's easier. Let's make no mistake about it. It's easier. It's easier to stay out of the ministry. You don't have to live by faith. I I'm telling you something that I've wrestled with my whole ministry life and was just before agonizing this over, uh, over with God just a couple of days ago. I said, Lord, am I ever going to get used to living by faith? Am I ever going to realize that not one person in this house is my source? You're my source. Am I ever going to realize that I'm safer in your will than the president of Microsoft is? I'm safer in your will. Some of you in here, you've got good jobs, you make good money, but you're not as safe in that, if it's not God's will, you're not as safe as I am. Or somebody else is making, you know, pastoring a church and, and everything looks unstable, everything looks fragile, but they're right in the center of what God wants for their life. Please hear me. One day when you and I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, nowhere in the Bible does the Bible say that tears are going to end when you and I go home. There will be tears at the judgment seat of Christ because many people will have avoided their divine purpose. It was too risky. It, it, it necessitated faith. It necessitated that I let go of comfort zones and, and safety, that, you know, these things that made me feel safe. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, Satan fights nothing. Paul said he was not just an anointed man going from service to service. He was not just going from church to church. He said, I am a man of purpose. I have a purpose from God. There is a purpose set down in my life. You look at people that make all kinds of money, but there's a hole in their heart. You look at Christians that have never really... So many people, they're, they're even scared to even ask God, what is my purpose? What did you create me for? Like I said, it's a horrible analogy. But this thing was only created, truly created. It was only created for one purpose. No, nothing else. You're not created. In the, in the eyes of God, you were not created for two things, three things, five things, ten things. You were created for one thing. And you've got to come to a place in your life where you are saying, what is that one thing? Now I'm going to say something, and I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I've been where he's at. Pastor John could have easily lost his life. God's done a miracle. Yeah. And that's what happened to me two years ago, or three or whatever it was. But you know what I you know what it did in me? Is laying, and I told you this laying in a bed in Wenatchee, in the Central Washington Hospital. I woke up in the middle of the night. And it didn't push me away from and, and we've been through, in fact, I believe a lot of what brought that on was warfare. But it didn't push me away from the purpose of God. It pushed me even harder into the purpose of God. And I woke up in the middle of the night and I said, I've never given you at all. I never have given you everything. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something. Now, this is what I believe. I believe that this nation right now, you've got two groups of people in the church. One that is seeing it for what it is, and one that is seeing it for what God is saying to them. And I don't believe that America is going to go down yet. I believe there's one last great move of God. And you know where it's coming from? 
It's going to come from the younger generation. The generation that everybody has written off and said they're a bunch of liberals and they're going to destroy the country and they don't have any morals and, and, and they don't care about anything valuable. I believe it's that generation. I read, I read yesterday and this was so proud. We think we're the first generation of people that there's ever been a rising in the spirit that wants to cast off moral restraint. But we're not. Psalms 3 says that David faced that same spirit in his day. And this is what he said. And, and you know, sometimes when I look at what's happening in America, I can get really hopeless. I, I, can, I can reach back. You know, I, I went around Orville High School yesterday and, and, I, and I walked around and walked around and walked around and prayed. And I said, Father, what, are you, what our church needs we, I'm 48 years old. I'm not young. I'm old. You're old. Many of you are old. No, I'm serious. And what we do is we sit here and think as long as people are here that are my age and as long as people are here when I'm here, I'm going to tell you something. We're a dying church if we don't get some teens and 20s and people radically saved. You, this, this church is going to die going to die and you're either going to have to deal with your comfort zone or understand that God has to do something or we're one generation away from not existing anymore. Amen. And I walked around Orville High School and I said, God, you know what we need? We need one young man, one young woman to radically encounter Jesus. I mean, to, I don't care how broken they are. I don't care how unpopular they are. I don't care how bound they are. I don't care how goofy they are. I need one young man or one young woman to radically encounter Christ and lose all the fear of what other people think and go into their high school and say, you know what, you need Jesus in your life. And I'll tell you, that's what we need. Brothers and sisters, hear me. What you and I, what you, you cannot, what you can but we cannot, if we're going to see the power, we can't sit here and say, hey, as long as, as long as my marriage is good, as long as my family's good, I'm good. I know I, I, I can give lip service to caring that there's a world that's lost and dying, but do you ever do anything about it? Is there ever a moment that you get on your face? I know I'm preaching all the time, but is there ever a moment you get on your face? Is there ever a burden for lost people? Do you ever see a young man or a young woman walking down the street broken and bruised and think to yourself, I need to turn around and talk to them? I'm going to tell you, I have. And I have not because I'm a pastor. I, 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 I've, been, I've been searching my soul and saying, God, do I do this for a paycheck? If this church could no longer pay me, would I live the same way? Would I do the same things? Would I have the same passion? Brothers and sisters, hear me tonight. You, have, you at some point, if you're going to experience God's power, you need to find what the true purpose of God is in your life. Why was I created? Hear me. Most people mistake natural purpose for God's purpose. They think, well, well, I, I'm in the purpose of God. Are you? I'm not saying you're not. But just listen, most of the time we mistake what is God's will for our life with what comes natural to us. We think, well, I must, I must, this must be what I'm supposed to do because it comes natural to me. That's absolutely untrue. If it comes natural to you, more than likely, it's not God's purpose. Because God's purpose will take God's power to have you walk in it. Pastor John has said this, I've said this, you've heard Pastor Shane say it. You could, have, you could never have got me up behind a, a, a pulpit to speak to a group of people. This has been whatever kind of small ministry that, I, that I've had that's taken God to do. It has taken God to do. Listen, true purpose, I've said this to you, true purpose needs revelation. Paul needed a revelation encounter with Jesus to know what his purpose was. You and I, need a, a, a re, we need an encounter with Jesus to say, what is my purpose? You know, one of the things we've started doing because we've had classes and classes and classes and classes and classes of Roost House students through the years and Timothy House now has been going for two years as we start talking to our students about purpose. What is your purpose? 
Listen, I, I look at Nathan and Mel and, and Katie and Jeffrey, and when you first get married, you're thinking, this is it? I mean, marriage is life. <laughs> all I ever need, all I, oh, let me tell you I'm not saying it's not good. I'm just saying it will not meet. It will not meet the cry of your heart. If you're a man or woman of God, it will not meet the cry of your heart. It'll be something that longs to, to have God use you. I was singing the song today to myself. I don't even know all the words to it, but it says that that old gospel song that says, Jesus use me. Uh, Jesus use me. Please, Lord, don't refuse me. Surely there's a work that I can do. I don't know rest of Yeah, but hey, I am too. I know it. So. Listen, purpose is connected to your spirit. Paul said that I was purposed in my spirit. You know, I think when we talk about worship and spirit and in truth, whenever you talk about worship in modern Christianity, we think of music, we think of songs, we think of the worship service. I don't think that's what that scripture means at all. I think spirit worship is when I allow God to speak to my spirit. When I allow God to deal with my spirit. You see, I'm going to tell you something. For a lot of you, the reason you don't know the purpose is because you don't want to. God scares you. Your scared God is going to ask you to do something that's out of your comfort zone. That will, that will demand that you lay down some things that you don't know if you're ready to lay down. Brothers and sisters, I'll tell you something. You'll never be disappointed with letting God have His will for your life. Never. Let me talk about the demands of purpose. The demands of purpose will be that you, will, in order to fulfill them, You'll need the power, the supernatural power of God. Listen to this. You will have to reject having power without purpose. You will reject the notion of I'm just going to be a show off. I'm just going to, I'm just going to hop around the church and I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to do, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to be kind of a flame in the body but never have a purpose. Brothers and sisters, you'll reject, you'll have to reject that. There'll come a time, at least if the Holy Spirit's working in you, there'll come a time that you say, I need the purpose of God. I want the purpose of God. Number two, the demand of purpose is knowing the timing of God. Ecclesiastes 8.6 says, to every purpose, there is a time. There's a timing for the purposes of God in your life. Number three, there'll be a lion's den for anybody that has the purpose of God in their heart. The Bible says that it was actually... God's purpose that made sure that there was a stone on the lion's den and there was no way Daniel could get out. Because that lion's den is where Daniel would learn that God could supernaturally protect him. Listen, sometimes you're not fighting evil people. You're not fighting the devil. You're not fighting in that. You're fighting God. It's God's purpose that has put a stone over your escape hatch and said, it's not my will for you to escape. It's my will for you to stay in this and watch me protect you. And watch me, watch me supernaturally take care of you. Man, I wish yeah. I needed to sit here preach that back to me whenever I need it. <laughs> number, number four, the purposes of God will demand that you grow. You will have to grow. You will have to grow. You'll have to grow emotionally. You'll have to mature spiritually to fulfill the purpose. Listen to this. Jesus said this to Paul. He said, for this purpose I've appeared to you. God never gives a person revelation just to tickle their fancy. God doesn't just appear to anybody just to just so they can go tell somebody I've had an encounter with the Lord. God always you always encounter, you always have revelation. God always has a purpose in that. Brothers and sisters, I think the reason that we see so little done in the kingdom is because there's so many people. They want power, they want notoriety, they want fellowship, they want they, they want all that, but they don't want purpose. How many people have I watched through the years that in my spirit I know they've rejected the purity of the purpose of God in their life? I know that in my heart. I know there's been a moment.
that them and the purpose of God collided. And so many people at that moment privately between them and God. In fact, for many of them, it'll only be known before the, the, the when they stand before the Lord. Only them and God will know that there was a moment where God confronted them with the purpose of God and they said, no, I'm not going that way. There's too many unknowns for a lot of people. Listen, and, and let me just say this. I'm not trying to make anybody fearful, but you will give an account. You and I will give an account for the unfulfilled purposes of God. The thing that God had called you to, and deep in your heart you knew it, or you could have known it if you were willing to get honest, but you did not want to know it. You and I will give an account before God one day when we stand before Him for those things. There are few, Daniel shows us this, there are few that decide on the purposes of God. There are few that decide to walk in it. Daniel 1, 8, out of all of the thousands of captives that were taken from Jerusalem to Babylon, only one, well, there was four of them, but it started with Daniel. The Daniel, the Bible says, stood up. And we talk about purpose in, a, in, in, in the sense of purposing to stand against sin, purposing to be a man or woman of God as far as integrity. And that's a good thing. But I don't think it did not end there with Daniel. Daniel made a decision. I'm going to walk out the purposes of God. I'm going to find out why God created me. Hear this again. I want this to stick in your mind. There's only one reason this music stand was created. There's only one reason. It could sit in the back room and never fulfill its purpose. It could get dust on it, never fulfill its purpose. It was created to do one thing. You could put flowers on it, but that's not what it was created for. You could use it for a lot of things. You could use it, I suppose you could use it for a, a, a you know, what? A coat rack. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, like I just did. That would not be its purpose. Brothers and sisters, hear me. I, I want to dwell on this. I hope maybe to kick your chair tonight. But you can live a mundane life and come and come to the end and say, man, I never experienced it. And go as far as to say, God's not real. I never encountered the power of God. I never saw supernatural things. It's because power goes where purpose does. I, I wonder how many of the apostles, how many of the early church saw, probably none of them saw what Paul saw. Because they wouldn't embrace the purpose of God that he did. You and I, I'm telling you something, Satan will try to fight the purpose of God with offense. He'll, he'll try to do anything to get you derailed from the purposes of God in your life. Number five, number six, in the demands of purpose, you will have to control your fears. You'll have to allow God to control your fears. Brothers and sisters, listen, if you live in a place where you don't need divine power over your emotions, you won't have it. But I'm going to tell you something. If you're going to follow the purpose of God, you're going to have to have a supernatural power over your mind and your emotions. Say, Pastor, why in the world would I want that? Because there's nothing like where Jesus said, I don't give peace as the world gives. You, my peace is yours. I give you my peace. You can claim it. You can walk in it. You can experience it. I'm telling you something. I would rather have that. And Because, you know, what the, I, I've told you this before. When you and I come to the end of our life, you know what's going to comfort you? You know this. It's not going to comfort you that you had money. It's not going to comfort you that you had a good husband or a good wife. They can stand there and they can be by they can hold your hand, but they can't crawl inside of you. The only thing that will be able to bring peace to your spirit is when you look back like Jacob did. The Bible says he was leaning on a staff. What that actually means is he was feeling, he was going over, he was reading, because they carved it into their staff. He was reading all of the encounters he had, had with God. And that's what his comfort was as he was dying. And when you and I die, that's what's going to comfort us when we look at and we, and we begin to rehearse the encounters with God. I'm going to tell you something. I'm holding on to that with dear life. I pray to the Lord, Lord, get me over the finish line. Get me across the finish line. I've entrusted my life. I've entrusted my soul to you. I've given you everything. I have nothing left. Cindy and I have put everything we are. I've put everything I know to put into the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, hear me tonight. The last thing, if you're going to fulfill the demand or have the, the purpose of God over your life, you have to allow counsel. Proverbs 20.18 says, if you're going to have the purposes of God, you have to allow counsel. Counsel of other people that are walking in purpose. Counsel of other men and other women of God that have made that scary choice to abandon all and follow Jesus. Do you know why there's things I only talk to other pastors about? Because only another man 
that has made the decision and another woman that has made the decision to walk out on water would understand the emotion of it. You have to surround yourself. Listen, I, I know this is an extreme, but I used to tell my girls, I used to tell my kids when they were growing up, if you want the advice of an august, uh, an august intelligent 16-year-old, then that's what you're going to go to. You know, if you, if you, you know, who told you that, my friend? Oh, well, gee, they've got, they're, they're 16 just like you are. They've got to be right, you know? But if you want a 40-year-old or a 45-year-old, or you want somebody's counsel that has gotten to the other side, that's, listen, who you want to hear is who you're going to go to. You're already making a decision what you're going to hear or what you want to hear by the person you chose to go to. I know there's people that don't come to me. They don't want to hear my counsel. The fact they won't come to me already tells me they don't want to hear what I have to say. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, it's the truth. It's the truth a million times over. I'm going to tell you something. I was listening today to a prophecy by David Wilkerson. Prophesied in 1973. And he's, and he's talking all the time. He's prophesying. He's saying, I was scared to give this to the church. I thought everybody would think I was an absolute idiot. I, they thought, I, I thought they would think I was a freak. 40, what is it, 70, 43 years ago, he prophesied that there would be pornography on public television. 43 years ago, people laughed at him and said, that's so extreme. You're so wrong. You're so way out. And now we're living it. He prophesied of uncontrollable, long-lasting economic uncertainty that would come just before a worldwide economic crash that people would not be able to control, that the greatest minds in the world would have no answers for. Brothers and sisters, he prophesied of a thousand fires burning in New York City. You know what that sounds like to me? Riots. Social unrest. I told somebody the other day, and you'll probably never hear me say this again, but I told somebody the other day, I think America, in Zechariah chapter, what is it, chapter 12, I think it is, where the Bible says that Jesus shepherded Israel with two staffs, staffs beauty and bands. The staff called bands actually meant that God would touch two people and band them together. They would be bonded together. And at the end of Israel, as you watch Israel slipping into judgment, God was using that same staff to break bands. And unity and things that held Israel together as a nation now were being, were being blown apart. I'm going to tell you something. I don't, I'm not a prophet. I'm not, as Amos said, I'm not the son of a prophet. But it would not surprise me to watch America drift into social unrest after this election. I believe there's more anger, there's more animosity, there's more uncertainty, there's more differences in America today than at any time in my lifetime, by far. And that thing, I've told my children, the only thing holding that unrest under the surface is the ability of the United States government to pay people and to give money to people and to make promises to people to keep it tamped down. And I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I'm going to tell you something. As your pastor, it would not surprise me. But it will give birth to the greatest revival the world has ever known. I believe that. I believe that. So let me talk about the effect of purpose on your life. Number one, the effect of purpose will disconnect you from other purposes. It will disconnect you from all other purposes. All the other purposes. I've watched people get a hold of the call of God. And, and, and jobs that, that used to just be their life. And and making money, and all that, ju it just loses their hold. And they come to you and say, man, you know, I just, I just don't have a heart for that anymore. What I have a heart for is the kingdom of God. The purpose of God, when it grabs a hold of your life, will disconnect you from every other. It doesn't mean that you'll have to quit your job. It doesn't mean that, but it means that your heart will be in what God has called you to do. Number two, God will feed the purpose of God in your life. Ruth chapter 2 and verse 16. The Bible says that God, or that Boaz told men that were working with Ruth, put handfuls of purpose. You know why some people are fed in the kingdom? You know why some people can open this book and it pours into their soul? And other people are dry and they can't get anything from it? It's because they've been to a place... I'm not talking about the young. I'm not talking about some of you that are young. I'm talking about old Christians. Somewhere in their life, there was a moment where God said, are you going to follow my purpose? And somewhere inside, for whatever reason, they said, no. 
And the book has never spoke to them the same way. It's never spoke the same way. I believe that. Brothers and sisters, listen. Number three, the effect of the purpose of God is that you will be attacked by the enemy. The enemy will come against your life. He will try to steal because this purpose is the most divine thing that God can ever put in a man or a woman's heart. Number four, your purpose will be your platform. Nehemiah, you know what? That, you know, it just struck me. That's not Ezekiel, that's Ezra. It just struck me what that was. Turn your Bibles to Ezra, chapter 4. God just touched my remembering. Listen to this. I want you to hear this. If you're not careful, man, God help me tonight. Holy Ghost, bear down on this tonight. This church will only survive if this gets through to people. Hear me tonight. What Satan's after is your purpose. And when Satan comes and says, buddy, you need to make money. You need to make money. Your need is money. You need to make a good living. You need this. Satan's after your purpose. I'm saying that to men and women that are truly called. You know, if, if you follow the purpose of God, maybe this is going to happen, or maybe that's going to happen. Listen to Ezra 4 5. It says that they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. You know what Satan does? Satan sends demonic counselors into your mind and says, if you follow the purpose of God, you're not going to have health insurance. If you follow the purpose of God, how are you going to make it? How are you going to survive? If you follow the purpose of God, what about your marriage? Maybe your marriage won't. If you follow the purpose of God, what about this? Maybe what about that? What if God sends you to Africa? What if God asks you to just pastor a small church all your life? What about that? What if God's purpose isn't for some huge destiny with thousands of people? If that's your dad, if that's the only way you'll follow the purpose of God, it's wrong. If that's your idea of purpose and that's what God has to bait you with to get you to follow, that's wrong. My, my purpose can't be decided on whether or not I have large crowds. My purpose has to be decided on whether or not I'm going to honor the call of God on my life. That's tough stuff, but it's the truth. And I've heard so many people try to bait people into following the purpose of God with saying, you're going to be famous. Yeah. You're going to be the next Billy Graham. You're going to be the next Jimmy Swagger. You're going to be the next whatever. You know what? If God said, none of those things are true. Men won't remember you, but I will. Right. Is that enough? Yes. Is that enough? I think that needs to be said. I'm going to say this to the Timothy house, to Ruth's house. We will never bait you into following God by saying you're going to be amazing. Everybody is going to chant your name. Won't bait. I believe my nephew is called. I do. I believe you've got to call a God on your life, Nathan. But nobody should ever be baited. And I'm going to tell you something. God will allow you to believe that foolishness to get you into the call. I believe that. I did. I'd be the first one to say, you know, and, and I kind of thought, you know, I, I, I kind of felt like uh, Jeremiah, right before the Lord, you tricked me. He said, no, I didn't trick you. You tricked you. I didn't trick you. You tricked me. Listen, I, I don't know how God's going to use me, and I've got to forget all about that. Right now, where I'm at in my life, I've asked the Lord for something. I've asked the Lord for the restoration of my daughter or my son-in-law's marriage. If you give me that, it'll be enough. I've asked God to give me the salvation of all of my children. If you give me that, that'll be enough. If you let Cindy and I enjoy you and enjoy each other until she goes home or I go home, that will be enough. You see, your demands, Jacob's demands changed as he got older. Yeah. As he recognized who he was and he recognized who God was. Yeah. Anybody that'll look at God and say, if you're not going to do it my way, I'm out of here. <laughs> they don't realize that God could say, hey, I want to take back my breath that I put in your lungs. Over. Brothers and sisters, God's God. God doesn't need me. God doesn't need me to do anything. I found that out three years ago. God doesn't need me. But I need Him. Amen. He's everything and I'm nothing. Amen. And I'll tell you something. Whenever I look back at those days and I think, 
Where in the world did I get it in my mind I was somebody? Where did I get it in my mind that I deserve something? I don't know where that came from, but I never want it back in my heart ever again. I was talking to my former son-in-law, reading my Bible two mornings ago, and I just had him on my heart, and I've always loved him. I've never stopped him. Had him on my heart two mornings ago, and I texted him, and I said, Brian, you're on my heart this morning. And I just, and I spoke life and I spoke love over him and I spoke encouragement over him. And he told me, he said, you're the only man that if I ever want to talk about Jesus, I'm going to you. And he said, you're the only man that's ever come across my life that has loved me that way. And I don't know where all that's going to lead, but I believe God gave me a promise two and a half years ago walking on a trail that God was going to restore my daughter's marriage. And I believe for that. See, my demands have changed. When you're laying on what you think is your deathbed, and doctors are coming in, and a nurse tells you, you know, a nurse is talking to you, and she says, well, we think you might have a brain tumor. All of your demands change. Right, Dennis? It all changes. It all changes. I'll tell you something. Brothers and sisters, the most valuable thing that God ever did in my life because here's what happens. I'm going to tell you something. The purpose of God will grow you up. You watch it how, I mean, you watch it how people act and how immature they can get and, and all of that. And you know why you can't relate? Because God has demanded more of you. God won't let you. I, I, I can say this. I know Pam and Shane would identify Pastor John Wood City. I know Wood. I know a lot of people. Have you ever said, I'm going to... I'm going, for once in my life, I'm going, to, I'm going to say what I think. Sometimes I feel like I've had 22 years of going. <laughs> the Lord says, I oh, know you won't. You won't because you love me. And I won't let you do that. But I said, oh God, I'm going to feel so you ever fantasized about a moment you could be blatantly honest? <laughs> Shut up, Randy. <laughs> Number four, effective purpose is to transcend your age. I want to say this. I want to say this to every elderly person in this house. I am hot on your trail, age wise. I'm following you, I'm not that far behind. In 12 years, I'll be 60 years old. In 22 years, I'll be 70 years old. 22 years ago, I was 26. And that time has gone by. And I'll tell you something. I started pastoring this church when I was 26. I'm going to tell you something. This is for me. It's not just for you. It's for me. I'm not just saying this to make you feel good. I'm saying this because it's life. David grabbed a hold of a new purpose at 70 years old. Or they're about 68 probably. He said, I have purpose and I'm going to build the temple of the Lord. You see, there's a time in every man or woman of God's life that you go from player to coach. You go from field to sideline. You go from, from the platform to the pew. You go from the center to support. There's that transition in everybody. Listen, I don't know. I don't know what the Lord has planned for City. I don't. I don't know. Sometimes I really want to know, but I, I know what I want for our life. I know that I want to gracefully fill whatever the Lord wants us to do until we go home. I want to be seventy years old, and I want to be on the front pew cheering some young fiery man of God on St. Man. Good go. I got your back, young man. I'm here. And I don't want to be the kind of... I don't need any praise. I don't need a position. I don't need you to pat me on the back. I'm here to pat you on the back. I'll tell you something. That's, the church needs that. Yes. The church needs people that they're mature in the kingdom. They're mature in Jesus. And they walk in the house and I don't need anything. I'm not asking for anything. I'm here to support you. I am here to be a kingdom fixture. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be alongside you. I'm going to help win the kingdom. I'm telling you, man, the church needs that. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, listen, as you grow old, find, let God for you. You, you, you can sit here and think, Pastor, I'm 65. 
I'm 67, I'm 72, I'm whatever, and I don't feel good. Whatever. God can pour a new purpose into your life. Yeah. Pour something brand new into your soul. Please hear me. I told you this. I invited, I, and I told you this earlier, we need young people, but we need old people. We need seasoned saints of God. I don't believe in this thing of having a young church or trying to appeal to just one group of people. I think that's the flesh. You need seasoned saints. You need people that have come. That have, and, and, and I was telling you this Sunday morning that I invited, I think she's the sweetest lady, I invited Mayor Spee's widow to church, and I hope she comes. But when she comes in this house, I, I, I didn't know that she was telling me the other day that they raised their children in the house of God. And, and just had a precious time with her. But I'll tell you something, I pray for God to send seniors into this house. I, I don't care if the first, I mean, I think it's wonderful that we have this new lady here Sunday morning. I can't remember uh, her name, but she came here with her son and daughter. Well, they are, all of them were here for the first time Sunday morning. And, and, she, and I talked to her after church, and she said, Pastor, I was raised in a law church in, in uh, Missouri. She said, when I went to church as a little girl, our heat source was a wood stove. But she said, but this morning, the Holy Ghost reminded me of what it was to be in the house of God. She said, I've been in the house of God for years. And she had, she had a stroke. And that's what began to draw her back. And she looked at her son and daughter, her daughter and son-in-law and said, I want to go to church. And Sister Anna, you were telling me that she was going to come and she you were here, right? So, you know, she was here. God moved on that lady's life. And I, I just want to throw this out to you. Hallelujah. You know, if, if Mayor Speaks' widow does come here, those of you that know her, love on her. Love on her if you see her on the street. Love on her if you see her in the store. Just love on her. But I want to get to a couple of last things. I know I'm way over time, but as long as I've, I've got you here, I've got about five more minutes. Number, th number uh, six, purpose draws people to you. I've told my kids this by their whole life. I've said, if you're in ministry, you'll never be lonely. You'll never be lonely. I've never been lonely, at least not for people in ministry. I've never been lonely. My phone has never had a time where it didn't ring. I've never had a time where there wasn't a need. I've never had a time where I've met somebody call me and say, hey, would you meet with me? Would you talk to me? Brothers and sisters, you'll never be lonely as you decide to give your life to the purpose of God. You'll never be lonely. Number seven, number six, the promises, the Bible says, Romans 8.28 says that all these promises are to those who are, who are walking. Let's read 8.28 because this never really gets fully read and fully... Uh, 8, 8, Romans 8.28. We all know it, but I'm going to read it. It says, all things work together for good to them that love God. Now, that's where most people stop. But it actually says this, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Not everything works for good to everybody. But it says that those that are walking in the purposes of God, it does. That's not, that promise actually is, it doesn't say to everybody. It says to those who are the called and are walking in the, according to the purpose of the Lord. Number last thing. You will be known by your purpose. Paul says, you have known my purpose. I'm a man of purpose. Maybe the greatest thing that could ever be said about you and I as a believer is they're a person of purpose. They had a purpose on their life. You could see a sense of purpose in their life. Let me get four things I want to share with you about purpose. Number one, you can lose your purpose. I know. I know, right? I hope my wife is good with that. You can, Job 17, 11, he says, my purpose, Job said this, my purposes have been cut off. Circumstances many times can make you think I've lost my purpose. My purpose has been cut off. God's no longer concerned with me. That's a lie. Purpose can be lost because there's no counsel. You've got to have counsel where there's the purpose of the Lord. You cannot fulfill it by yourself. Number three, circumstances, tragedy can change your purpose. Esau went from a man that had the call of God, the destiny of God, the leadership of of God over his life and he went instead to tragedy. His purpose became the killing of his brother. Think of that. And Ezra 4-5, we, we just read this, that other counsel 
other counsel can get you off track and get you on to something else. So stand with me tonight. Shin up here come. I know tonight has not been a shout and thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, but I believe it was the truth of God. And I believe it was destined for this service, and I believe who was supposed to be here is here. Father, I just come before you tonight, and I'm asking tonight that you open heaven. Please don't leave. I'm not going to dwell it. I can't promise you that, but please don't leave. Father, I'm asking you tonight that you would open heaven over people's hearts tonight. I can't make that happen. I can't make that happen. There's things that I, I believe I know about people in this room. There's things I believe you've shown me. I believe there's people here tonight that have a genuine call and purpose of God over their life. And the enemy is fighting it. The enemy already is at work and trying to, trying to get them to do something else, trying to get, get them to go a different direction. There's other people in this house, they need a revelation of God. They need to, they need to see what their purpose is. They need a moment that they have an encounter with God. And that they find the purpose of the Lord in their life. There's others that have walked away from their purpose. And they need to realign themselves with the purpose of God. And they need an encounter with you. For that reason, for that for the for that moment, Lord God, so that they can reestablish the purpose of God in their life. Let me just say something. God's job in your life is not just to give you a good marriage, or just to get you free from sin, or just to just to get you out of drug addiction or alcoholism or some kind of an addiction so that you can be a, a contributing citizen. That's not all God is concerned about. What God's concerned about is you encountering the purpose of God for your life and you honoring it and you following it. And it's not just about you getting what you want. It's about you being ready to surrender to the unknown and say, God, I don't know what your mind is, your will is, but, but I trust you. I want your purpose in my life. If you're here tonight and if there's one person that this has struck your heart tonight, if there's anybody here tonight, that you would say, Pastor, that's me tonight. I want the purpose of God in my life. Maybe you've had it and you feel like you've lost it. Maybe you've never found it and you want to find it. And maybe you need a revelation. You say, Pastor, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Or maybe you are sure, but you, you feel forces. You feel the counselors that we talked about out of Ezra tonight. You, you sense counselors in your mind and in your heart that's trying to move you in a different direction. Would you please come? Because I want to pray with you tonight. I won't take a long time, but I want to pray with you tonight. Well, God will really honor. Maybe you're here tonight and you're older. You're older. You're in the you're in the twilight years of your life. You're in the golden years. But you're here tonight saying, I don't want to live this these years of my life. I don't want to just give them away. I don't want to just assume that that, that my life now is whatever. I want, I want to fulfill the purpose of God in this season of my life for this moment, this season. I want to know and I want to walk in and I want to fulfill the purpose of God for my life. Come on. This is a kingdom thing. Maybe you're here tonight. Listen, I was going to say this earlier. I actually believe that people that walk, I'm not trying to be manipulative. I just believe this. That I believe God spared David's life many times. Because he was a man that was willing to fulfill the purpose of God. I believe sometimes lives are extended. Because God knows in that man or woman's heart they're willing to fulfill the purpose of God. Listen, if you're, if you're drab, you're, you're, you struggle with depression, you're, you're, your life just feels like, like it's never exciting. Get into the purpose of God. Because the Holy Ghost will start taking up the slack. The Holy Ghost will start stirring something in you. He will start stirring something in you. Heavenly Father, I just come before you and I confess to you tonight, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray right now. I'm not sure of what your heart is. I don't know how you want me to handle this altar call, but I believe that this message was from you. I believe it's one of the most serious 
things that we ever encounter in our life as a believer is the purpose of God. Maybe somebody's here, you're in transition, and, and you thought you knew what God's purpose was, but things have shifted and moved, and, and right now you're kind of fumbling, but you say, I want to know what God has for me in this season. I want to know what God has for me right now. I don't want to just hang around. I don't want to get offended and just take up a seat. I want to know what God wants to do with me right now, right here. Would you raise your hands to the Lord tonight? Just stretch them out to the Lord. Listen, it will be, it will be the cry of your heart. It doesn't mean it's going to happen tonight. But I promise you, if the seeking goes beyond this service, if you begin to get before God tomorrow and the next day and next week and next month, there's going to come a moment that you're going to come out of a prayer closet and you're going to have the revelation of God over your life. You'll have a word. I want to tell you something. This is not about this is not about purpose, but it is about the, the idea of a word. Cindy and I, we we asked for a word from God about our radio station building back in Mar February and March. And we prayed. I went out, I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed about that building. And we ended up, God ended up joining our minds on a particular fleece that we put out, an impossible one, something that had to be the Lord. And God answered it. It was a miracle. It was a miracle answer. But you know what? What we found out is we were going to need that. Because every obstacle of hell has come against that. And I'll tell you something. The reason why God gives you a word is a year from now or ten years from now. When you're walking in the purpose of God and there's warfare. And the enemy tries to come and, and mess with your mind. You'll be able to go back to that word. You'll be able to go back to that revelation. You'll be able to go back to that moment. And say, Satan, you're a liar. I got a word. And what you need, what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to open heaven over your life. I'm asking you tonight to open heaven. Ruth's house, Timothy house, listen. Don't be satisfied with sobriety. Don't be satisfied with, with that God got you sober and God got you out. And, and don't be satisfied with the job. And don't be satisfied with just a good, clean life. Chase the purpose of God. Chase the kingdom. Ask God what you have for me so that you can impact other people that were waiting for somebody to care just like you were. The same way you were. Paula, God spared your life for a purpose. So many other people in this room. God has caught, Dennis, I believe this even with you. I believe it. There's a purpose coming out of this. There's so many here. Listen, there's people you're drifting away. The fire is not what it used to be in your heart. Because you've departed from the purpose of God. You're getting away from the actual purpose of the Lord in your life. And there's a dimming fire in your heart. And I believe there's a, I believe there's a, a call going out. A clarion call going out to the heart of people that are in this room tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that the word of God that's been ministered here tonight echo in the hearts of your people. I pray that they can't shake it, God. I pray that it causes people to pray. It causes people to examine where they are. It causes people to ask you, Lord, am I really walking in all that you want me to do? Am I really walking in what I was created to do? Am I really walking in what I was born to do? Remember the music stand. One purpose. Everything else, you could use it for, but that's not why it was created. You were created for one purpose in the kingdom. Other things you can do, other things you have done, other things you're going to do. But in the kingdom, you were created for one purpose. Chase that. Know that. Father, there's people here that need revelation. There's people here that, that need a new revelation. There's people here that need something fresh for this season of their life. I'm asking you to do it. I'm asking, Lord, that between now and the end of our 21-day fast in January, that there will be an open heaven over this house, and that people that want to know will know. Listen, there's people here tonight, your marriage is struggling. There's other things going on in your life. Get a hold of the purpose of God. I believe that thing will heal. I do. I believe it will heal. Father, I ask it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now listen, before you leave.
I want to hear you pray yourself. Reach out your hands to the Lord. Come on, reach out your hands. And I just want you to ask the Lord between you and Him. I want you to ask the Lord, Lord, I want to know my purpose. I want you to speak to me. I, 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 I commit a season of prayer beginning tonight. I, am at, I begin a season of asking you, what have you called me to do? What's my purpose? Come on. Come on. It doesn't take a long time. Just a minute. Father, I thank you. I thank you right now for open heaven. I thank you for revelation. I thank you right now that you're doing it. You're going to do it. You're going to take the lid off of our life. You're going to take and you're going to pour into us. You're going to show us. You're going to speak to us because that, that you honor the cry of your people in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed tonight. Bless you.